From PocketNow.com, this is Pocket Now Weekly. Hello, and welcome to episode four of Pocket Now Weekly, the once a week podcast from PocketNow.com, where we discuss news and opinion from the world of mobile technology smartphones, tablets, phablets, and everything in between. I'm your host, Michael Fisher, contributing editor at Pocket Now. And I'm joined, as always, by our managing editor, Anton D. Nadja. Good afternoon to you, sir. This time it was worse than last time. It's Nadja. So no, wait, we, need to, we need to practice. Yeah, a little I bit. Did, I but don't we need to it. practice. I, I, Hi, everybody. I, I, <laughs> I, you, the first you guys time are I, fighting like girls. I'm sorry. Well, let me introduce Brandon. For, and our editor-in-chief, Brandon Miniman. Good morning to you, sir. Hi. Mine's easy to pronounce, like Yours cinnamon. It is easy to pronounce. <laughs> what, um, I want to ask you about that. Do, do people always comment on your name when did the brandon miniman joke start like i'm really really late to that do you know what i'm talking about yeah i don't really know it's uh it's been a while and i'm actually not pronouncing my last name properly but i i do so to make it easier to say it's uh pronounced miniman in in my family but miniman is sort of what uh back in high school and middle school people would call me so i just you know kind of kept with the miniman and it's easy to say and so oh you adapted well yeah I, I love it like anytime if listeners if you don't know what the deal is anytime brandon posts a video there's just like people accuse me of being high uh there will always be like in the first 10 comments somebody who just makes this 26 character Brandon Miniman joke like he's a, a game show host or something like that I like it I think you should introduce yourself that way one time yeah I'm probably gonna do that next time but uh yeah no Tony I swear I thought uh I thought I had it right this time I thought I thought I was no, we'll practice set. we'll all keep right. on practicing Nod we'll you. get this one right all right <laughs> um as uh, listeners, as Tony and Brandon know, I'm just coming back from a uh, from some time away. I'm on. I've lost track. I think I'm on like my fourth or fifth wedding of the year. Uh, not mine. Uh, this time it was extra <laughs> special because uh, it was my brother's. So I'm just coming back from a week uh, for from a couple of days in, in Lake Tahoe, uh, which was beautiful and wonderful. And so, but the point is, I'm catching up. I. Uh, I've been rushing to try and catch up with all the topics that have been covered because out there, I didn't even have LTE. It was a strange and or super rural existence <laughs> trying to. It's scary. Yeah, very frightening. Trying hey to guys, I have a question TVDO. about weddings. Yeah. Uh, wrong, wrong podcast, I guess, but I, I'm, I'm curious. What are the customs in, in the U.S. regarding uh, marriages? So in here, in this part of Europe, and especially in Romania, when somebody attends someone else's wedding, that other person is obliged to invite that person, that first person who was at their wedding, and this one is obliged to go back. So if you went to like five or six weddings, then you have to invite the other to your wedding whenever oh. that happens oh that's interesting i i think it's reciprocal that way in the u.s for um like if you're in somebody's wedding party like it's like oh you were my groomsman then you know it's kind of you're not obliged necessarily but it's nice to extend that invitation once you get married but hmm. i don't know about invitations I, I, brandon you're married how's that work i don't really know <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh <laughs> I'm uh I'm I'm involved in a wedding in two weeks and I'm a best man and I'm I'm working oh. on the speech and uh, yes that's sort of unrelated. There's a there's a tradition that uh, here here in the states, Tony, where uh, anytime you see the groom, you have to slap him in the face. Oh yeah, <laughs> so I so want to move there. Do, do, do you have something re imp uh, implying the bride too? Uh, no, you, you have to be nice to her. You, you to slap the groom. You slap the groom in, in the face to give him a preview of what married life will feel like oh. <laughs> over the years. So by the time the end of the night rolls around, you know, he can... Uh, he can uh, Make an informed decision. There's an yeah. informal saying here in Romania about marriage that it's, it's a huge, huge, huge pile of beep. And once you get to lick down the honey at the top, you get to the beep. Oh God! <laughs> Wait, is it is it like a thing in Romania to to to, to kind of like put honey on top piles of uh, of excrement? Or, or <laughs> well, I, I I actually didn't come up with that synonym, but yeah, it's a good synonym. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> so I, well, it's 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 good, uh, Brandon. Good luck with the with the best man duties. I uh, I've I've done that once this year and. Um, it can be a lot of fun. For some reason, everybody expects you to know where the bathroom is, no matter where <laughs> where you are. It's so great. Just be prepared for that. Um, we uh, there, just a podcast logistics note. We are uh, we are talking about getting um, Joe 
Jaime uh, on the podcast, as well as um, we'd like to have our podcast winner, excuse me, our giveaway winner on the podcast, Ashley, as well, just for a few minutes to talk about the phone she won. Um, the only thing is uh, planning for that happened right before I left. So I, I'm, I just got back yesterday. So uh, unfortunately, that's not able to happen this week, but hopefully we can get to it next week. But we are listening to you, uh, readers. Um, we've gotten multiple requests for both Joe and Jaime and a couple other members of the team. So that's awesome. I love hearing that. And we're going to get the rest of the team on the air here, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Lots of fun. Yeah. Go Speaking ahead, of lots of fun, uh, I've got something. Something. Hit it. My mom told me to end ING words with G, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> um, so remember last time we were talking about uh, sort of a divergent future where – Either we're going to be streaming content, and content defined as music, movies, uh, mm-hmm. TV shows, and everything, or we will download content and store it on our devices, mm-hmm. right? And, and we kind of agreed that streaming would be the future thanks to ubiquitous, fast networking. Um, and, and it was kind of funny because storage prices or, or the, the pl- prices of flash memory is going down and down, but that doesn't really matter as much because bandwidth is becoming more available. Uh, and so we'll stream lots of, lots of stuff instead of download it. You guys remember that? Oh, yeah. Yep. So I thought about a third possibility, and I'm going to present it to you guys, and you can, ask, you can try to sort of downplay, not downplay, you can try to um, play devil's advocate and say why this wouldn't work, because it's kind of extreme. It's very extreme. And uh, I, I just thought it would be probably the best of all worlds, and it wouldn't be possible for probably four or five years, um, even, even accounting for the rapid acceleration of technology. So here it is. Did you patent the idea? No. Oh, boy. I, I, maybe I should. I was going to say, um, are you sure you want to bring, bring this up? It, it's, not, it's, not that, you know, it's not that brilliant, but I think it's very intriguing. So imagine in five years, storage prices for flash memory was so cheap that we could have uh, exabytes of data on our phone, which would be a thousand, thousand terabytes. So it's, it goes gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte. So exabyte... And, and an exabyte is almost like having infinite storage. So the, the, the purpose of the exabyte would be to be able to hold all the content that's ever been produced, or at least all the content that exists on iTunes, all the content exists on Google Play. So you would buy a device, and it would literally come preloaded with every piece of content that has ever been created. And what would happen is that when you buy a song or buy a movie or buy a TV show, it unlocks a part of that massive data store. Um. And so you're not streaming it, you're not downloading it, you're unlocking it. And Mm. because you've got multiple devices, a laptop and a tablet, it's unlocked across all of your devices. and then, and then the question is, well, what happens when new TV shows are added, new movies are added? Well, every night, your device, when it's plugged in, it has to be plugged in, and you can choose whether it syncs over Wi-Fi or over, uh, by then, LTE Advanced or probably something even better than that. Uh, it brings for, it updates the catalog, whether it's iTunes or Google Play or whatever else is out there. So you always have the latest um, content offering on your, on your device. Um, what, what do you guys think about this? It's kind of in the middle. Tony? I, I don't like it. I mean, yeah, the idea as the idea is good by itself, but I don't know whether it's feasible. And not because the uh, huge storage, I'm sure we'll get to huge storage devices in time. Not that big of a storage device, but uh, huge storages. I think that copyright will be a huge, huge player in this game. And as you mentioned, it will be unlocked, but of course the underground community will always be at work for unlocking. And I think it just wouldn't be fair for the artists, for the developers, or for somebody who produces intellectual property for the intellectual property to actually be there in the hands of somebody, even without the, them accessing it. Well, let's pretend that the um, purveyors of, of, of the content have created a mechanism so incredibly secure that even the best hackers in the world can't figure out how to okay. unlock <laughs> unlock the system or unlock the content uh, if they're not authorized. Okay, so, then I think this would kill the Internet. This would also... 
Yeah, because you will no longer need to go to the internet and browse and look for content because it will be there. Basically, your internet needs will be um, slimmed down to your phone or your tablet communicating with the server, telling the server to unlock that specific content, and that's it. You will no longer be streaming, you will no longer be consuming high amounts of data, and that will kill internet and carriers. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost the same scenario I mean, the buying process will be the same as it is today. You go into the Google Play Store, except when you hit purchase, there's no downloading. It just, you know, it's there. Yeah. So exactly. I, and and then the carriers, the carriers will no longer need to charge you on your, I don't know, 100 megabytes necessary for you to download the, an album. It will only charge you for those, I don't know how many kilobytes necessary for that specific album to be unlocked. Uh, so, so you're saying, you know, people will use less data and carriers Absolutely. will hate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well... well I mean, oh, it, good, it is kind of the same amount of data, though, isn't it? I mean, because these nightly downloads, when new content gets generated, I mean, the, the content still has to get to your phone. Even in that initial blast, like if you, your phone, or whatever this exabyte device, you know, comes out of the box, it doesn't come out of the box with the content. Like, it has to get okay, the here's something. download initially. Right? Uh, Michael, we're going to, to Berlin at the end of this month, yeah. and we will both be in roaming. That means we will have data disabled because we don't want to have huge data bills. Mm -hmm. uh, once we get back home after one week in Berlin, our phones will download overnight huge gigabytes of data. And I think that will basically clog the pipe. Hmm. Well, that's, it, it, it's interesting. It's definitely an idea for like a, for a future uh, architecture for a future set of capabilities. I, I like the idea. I think, I, I, Brandon, I know we already put in this hypothetical thing where the encryption is like perfect, but I've never met, I've never met encryption like that. Or, you know, I, I think that the big obstacle to something like this is that you, the trade-off is not enough. You, you get a whole lot more risk for the copyright holders in exchange for not a whole lot more convenience for them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you, Brandon. Who would be the person or the persons or the group of people who would be gaining, winning from this, except for the end consumer? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, who would have the interest to implement this aside from, from you and me and our listeners and our readers? That's. I think that's a complicated question because that... That implies that uh, you know iTunes, uh, the, the iTunes infrastructure undergoes stress because people are pulling content from their servers. And, and by the way, Michael, the, the idea with this exabyte phone or tablet is that when you buy it from the store, it's got the most up-to-date data store, probably 98% of the way. Uh, so when you bring it home and you plug it in, the first sync might be a little bit more intense because you're getting that 2%. But you know, each subsequent night, it's like you know, you know, the 0.01%. Um, I know you, Brandon, read the Steve Jobs uh, tribute and biograph uh, biography. Uh, I'm not sure if Michael read it or yeah. not. Oh, yeah, I read it. I love yeah. it. Do you guys remember the basically battle which, which went between Steve Jobs and the record labels for iTunes? They basically didn't want to have any of the content sold digitally. Do you think those exact labels, record labels, and we're, we can also talk about, about uh, movies, would they ever agree to something like this? Well, well I, I see your point. And, and look at it this way. Um, right now, to download a song on a fast network or Wi-Fi, it doesn't take much time. But to mm -hmm. download a movie, um, it's Maybe not... Maybe for it, you. <laughs> oh, come on. No, even even for you, Tony, with your speeds, it's it's not instantaneous. And if you had this exabyte device and you wanted to download Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, there would be no downloading. You'd press buy and it's available within a half a second. You no, know, that, yeah, that that is compelling. I mean, that that I was I was just going to ask you like what problem does this solve, Brandon? You know, like I I don't understand why why this is why this is so appealing but no that just happened to me i was at the airport i was being i was on a being delayed multiple times in a row i was at the airport in san francisco all afternoon and i wanted to watch a movie and if you must know i wanted to watch 500 days of summer because i was feeling really really uh, moody and uh, dark and uh, I don't know. I wanted to see Zoe Deschanel, maybe. I don't know. But I started the download while I was on a mobile hotspot, and it was like, okay, sweet, I'm doing that. Uh, 328 minutes remaining. Huh. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I can't. Come on, man. I'm going to be on a plane, you know? Um, so I understand now it, the appeal of that is very clear. It's like, okay, I want to watch this movie. I buy it. Oh, now it's just unlocked, and it's right there. It's instant. I don't have to wait for, for a data, data stream. And this was over LTE, you know, where my problem happened. So hmm. I definitely get the appeal. 
Okay, prediction, never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, pro- yeah, probably never going to happen. I just, uh, you know, when we got off the, the podcast last week, I, I, you know, this 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 was uh, seemed like a an interesting third possibility, even though it's it's very unlikely. Um, but it's uh, anyway. So I thought it was uh, interesting. I'm glad we got to discuss it a little bit and point out Thanks some of it. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing it. In. No, that I think never is a strong word. I think we'll, as we see giant storage explosions happen in the future, we're going to see possibilities like this open up. I just don't think it's going to happen anytime, anytime soon. But uh, it'll definitely be something to keep an eye on. You want to mark this for uh, for I told you so uh, fuel in twenty years, Brandon. <laughs> twenty years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we're still waiting for that one twenty eight gig smartphone. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Well, wait. Well, no, you can do it now with the uh, Galaxy S three, can't you? No, I mean built-in and oh, super okay. super high-speed flash memory. Roger. Roger. Uh, <laughs> Roger. Um, jumping right into Android here, um, I uh, I'm still kind of in, in vacation head, and uh, I wrote a piece just yesterday called "How the Nexus Seven Became My New Best Friend." Um, we're still kind of riding the wave of Nexus Seven love here along with a lot of other consumers because you know most people are still receiving their Nexus Sevens in the mail, so it's still a very hot new device and i don't necessarily like writing fanboyish pieces i maybe i do i don't know i I don't know how i feel about that but uh well i enjoyed writing this one in any case um because i just couldn't help it i had spent the last four days with family and and friends gathered for this wedding and it i have to tell they couldn't keep their hands off my nexus 7 and it, it started before that i was getting talk on the on the train on the plane is that an ipad what is that is that a small type what is, is that the new google thing um so it's 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 hot right now and it's hot for a really good reason you know it was mm-hmm. even after that initial spike of interest passes like what is that oh it's the nexus 7 um people wanted to see it and when as the vacation went on and we're share, i'm sharing instagram photos and whatever and I, like i'm just passing this thing around the room and people wouldn't let go of it for hours, I just I left it downstairs one day to forever because everybody wanted to use it, and I was like, "Well, I'm going to bed. Normally, I would be reading on that thing when I go to bed, but <laughs> you guys play with it because you love it so much." The, the Nexus Seven is way hotter than I thought it was going to be. Uh, hey, what do you think, how, guys? How how long does your Nexus Seven take to charge? Uh, charging time, I I don't really know. It doesn't seem to be the speediest nor the slowest. I know it its battery life is not lasting quite as long as I would have hoped. Um, but uh, what? Why? What's? What's? You have a charging problem? Well, uh, yeah. When I when I reviewed the the Nexus Seven, one of my biggest complaints was that it it took seven or eight hours to charge. Oh, that's right. And, it's still you know, better than the new iPad. Yeah, it's still better than the new Good iPad. Uh, but then Jaime got his and said, you know, there might be there might be something wrong with your unit, Brandon, because mine charges in through half the time. And I'm just I'm trying to figure out if I have a faulty unit or if there's just a charging problem. Well, so you're, are your physical fancy. chargers the same? Um. I don't know. Uh, yours, yours is a dev unit, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yours is a fancy white backed unit. Yeah, but yes, but that I guess maybe it, it might Check be an the early model. Um, I'm I'm using the best charger that I can find, which is no, no. You use its own charger. Were you using its own charger for the uh, when you did the the review, or do you do you remember? Yeah, I used the uh, the Asus charger, which is the one it came with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so and and that that took seven hours. Can mm-hmm. I ask real quickly? When I told people it was the Nexus Seven, I was like, "Yeah, the, man, the hardware is manufactured by Asus. Is it Asus, Ace, Asus, Asus, or Asus? Because I've always said Asus. Am I wrong? Well, I can tell you, I'm telling Asus. Asus. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to be able to say that. People are just. <laughs> well, it's, what, 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 Brandon, what do you usually call it? I mean, I know we're probably both wrong. I call it Nokia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so that's yeah, that's the story in the Nexus Seven. I think Tony, I know that you're not amped on it. I wasn't excited about it either. I'm gonna bring it to Berlin. Oh, you play with you, mine. You're gonna you're gonna bring mine too to Berlin, my friend, because oh. I just I'm just preparing to order one. Oh, are you? Yeah, actually, I know, I know, I know. You are all entitled to tell me I told you so. And I actually did a tweet 
And I said, I'm not going to get one, but you got one. Brandon's got one. Jaime's got one. And Joe's got one. And everybody speaks so highly of it. Now, the problem isn't the fact that I cannot wait for Jelly Bean to arrive to my Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1, which I'm rocking at the moment, or I can just uh, put Cyanogen mod on it. I'm just curious to see that 7-inch form factor, because I've met some 7-inch form factor tablets at MVC, at IFA. I was like, nah. It's too small for a tablet, too big for a phone. But now that everybody says it's a super, hyper, super tablet, I'd need to have one, especially for that price. It's it's a bargain. For that price, that's the key. Yeah. It's a good price. Hey, hey, Michael, uh, yeah. when I pick up my Nexus 7, two things bother me so much to where I shortly thereafter put it down and I pick up the iPad. Whoa. Um, number one is the screen. I, I knew it. It's just like... It, I, I feel like it's it's got 256 colors. It's basically. the pixels. I was just going to say, is it pixels or is it colors for you? Because I'm the color snob. What do you mean? Is it the pixels or the colors? Well, I mean, you, you're always talking, Brandon. You're the you're the resident like pixel density, you know, fan enthusiast, right? He's the pixel yeah. density meter himself. Yeah, the, exactly. The human the, pixel the, density meter. The pixel density is is adequate. It's fine. I mean, that's not a, a worry. It's the color I, and. Um, you know, again, this might be my developer unit, but I don't think so because uh, Jaime actually has this problem too. Yeah, he Jaime describes the screen as horrible. Right. What do you think about the screen when you compare it? When you're sitting there with your Galaxy Nexus, which has the most vivid colors, or in I guess if you have just two devices in your hand, um, what do you think of the screen? Uh, you know, honestly, this is strange because I am usually a, a big display fanatic when it comes to colors. Uh, I, I really like what Super AMOLED screens do. I like oversaturated, blown out, tacky, if you will, colors. Um, and certainly the, the Nexus 7 doesn't offer that. Um, but, you know, it, it's also not gloomy. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't give me a washed out display experience. I know Jaime has said it's terrible. I know you don't like it. I, I don't, you know, I don't mind it. it. It is neither the best nor the worst display I've ever encountered. It really doesn't. <laughs> It, I don't hate on it. Uh, it Brandon, you mentioned 256 colors. Is the problem that the colors aren't vivid enough, or are you experiencing some bleedings and gradients? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I'd say the colors just aren't vivid enough. The, the, mm -hmm. the, bla the blacks are like a very dark gray. Yeah. And I'm flipping through every wallpaper I can find because I want to have a very beautiful wallpaper on this Nexus 7. And every wallpaper I put on... Even if it's a beautiful live wallpaper, it just looks bad. Have you tried mm. that one, that, that Vortex one that you and I both have? Yeah, it's one of the, the first one I tried, and it just, you know, it just, ugh. Anyway, so uh, the second thing that uh, that makes me put down the Nexus 7 for the iPad is the web browser. Um, it's just, for me, so slow. It's it's not like, yeah. I, I, what, Chrome? I, yeah, and and maybe I'm I'm now spoiled because every device that is around me right now is on Jelly Bean, and web browsing is unbelievably fast. But um, like, if I have a few tabs open and I open up a new tab, it slows down. And then, if I'm on a complex web page and I scroll around, I get these white boxes. And sometimes the touch response it doesn't seem to catch up with with my finger. It just I have see, experienced oh. that. Yeah, the touch response has gotten flaky on me a couple times too. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, you're not alone in that. That 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 is true. I I don't experience the slowness really, or the or the checkerboarding. I mean, the you know, Chrome does pretty well. It Chrome does a lot better on the Nexus Seven for me than it does on any of my handsets because I I find uh, Chrome on the Android phones to be really useful and packed with features, but often very laggy for me on on devices. And now I'm talking about my Nexus, uh, my Galaxy Nexus LTE and the Galaxy S3. So, uh, you know, for me, it was just a huge step up from that experience. And I'm not a giant fan of Safari on the iPad, so. Are you able to use the stock browser? I mean, uh, the stock browser, which comes with Android, no. not Chrome. No, no I, I wish you could. Chrome. Yeah, it ships with Chrome beta, and that's it. And yeah, mm. that's, it, it's, it's not, and it's not beta anymore, although it. it oh, I'm sorry, it's not beta, yeah. It very much feels like it is, though, so. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, I, every time I try and, like, every time I think that I have a complaint with the device where I'm like, well, that's annoying. I kind of put it through this filter where it, it, it enters my brain as this kind of annoyance. And then it goes through this filter where it's like, yeah, but how much did you pay for this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, 250 bucks. 
and yeah. then I'm like, you know, and then, and then I'm like, yeah, I've I've also handled another two hundred fifty dollar tablet. It was called the Kindle Fire, and at that time I liked it, but I it was also it felt like a a, a version one WebOS device. Um, where the lag was just so extreme compared to this buttery smoothness of Jelly Bean on the Nexus 7. So, you know, hey I, guys, I, quick I have exercise. What? What? The, quick exercise. Oh, okay. What do you think? <laughs> How do you think a $250 Apple tablet will behave, will look like in terms of build quality, screen, and stuff like this we care about? Knowing that they only do premium devices. It'll be like an awesome, small, thin iPad with hopefully a screen that has enough pixels on it. <laughs> so they, they will basically demolish the myth that you can build premium hardware at a low cost and with a low price tag. Well, yeah. I, uh, it's interesting to me to think about what kind of hardware variant they would make because I feel mm -hmm. like it would look a lot, like, a lot more like a, like a base-level MacBook where might, they might go with like an iPhone 3G backing on it. You know, instead of the metal unibody, just to differentiate it and to keep the regular iPad premium. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think know. it had those green problems you guys are referring to? No, no. Apple would never <laughs> let something like that out. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good point. Your point is well taken, Tony. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's funny because like part of my love affair with the Nexus 7 is the seven-inch form factor. Uh, and but I, I am now now that I have one and now that I have one running an OS that I really really like, I, I it would be that I have zero interest now in a seven inch iPad just because of its software because it's running, um, you know it would run iOS six which which is not interesting but that's a whole other ball of wax I suppose. Um, <laughs> oh my oh my uh, my touchpad is informing me it's time to wake up sorry about that. Ooh, uh, 930. <laughs> 930. I'm, uh, I'm a late, uh, I'm a night owl, listeners, in case you're not aware. Um, so moving on, we're, we're, uh, we're a little low on time. Um, as usual. We're, as usual. We're, it's good. I like being over time. We have a lot of stuff to discuss. Just briefly, I want to touch on this because <laughs> uh, ne the Nexus 7 was supposed to have a main camera, we've seen. Um, this, was, uh, this is a story by... Who is this? This is you, By Tony. Tony. Yes. yes. What's the deal on this? There was a, there's a spot on the board for it? Well, actually, XD developers did an unboxing, which wasn't really an unboxing a la carte, to say that. It was an unusual one, and they unboxed, and they also dismantled the phone up until the latest, the last chip and the main board, and the main board was actually, actually cut out exactly to the size required for it to fit a main rear-facing camera. Mm -hmm. And um, I have two theories about this. Uh, either we can wait in the future to see a similar tablet with a higher price tag with a main camera at its back, or it's just Asus simply reusing some of its own tablet uh, hardware components, like the uh, Memo, I think it was the 370 or something like that, which had a back camera. Or third theory, whenever they started discussing about the uh, Nexus 7, the initial plans were to include a main camera but then because of costs they just uh, didn't go with it yeah i think i think we're dealing with number one here where asus had been working on a a a, a seven inch tablet or when google approached them they said oh this is great we'll build the infrastructure for a seven inch tablet that we will later have a higher red screen on and a screen with more than 256 mm -hmm. colors and we will <laughs> we will we plan to sell it for 350 it will be like a premium seven inch tablet once you know you know asus isn't making that much money on the on the nexus 7 and so they think you know this will help to drum up support for the seven inch tablet market and then when we launch our premium Uh, seven inch uh, device in time for the for the holiday season people will be like oh this is like a nexus 7 but better on steroids that would be really really nice I, i think that's probably exactly where they were going with the business thinking on that do you think there will be a premium nexus tablet launched by the holidays N not it won't be called nexus i mean i think this is good for a year eight months or ten months yeah me too but i think that i think that we are going to see an ambush of seven inch tablets which is fantastic, um, in the next in the coming months because I think uh, it's been proven that people really like the the seven inch form factor. Hey, hey, Michael, have you taken off the uh, the back cover of your Nexus 7 yet? I have not. I am. Uh, it is still hermetically sealed. I. How do you do that anyway? 
it's very well it's not i mean it's it's meant to come off uh well it's not meant to come off but you don't have to break you don't have to break anything if you uh grow your fingernails out slightly longer than usual and you just shimmy them under the case it just pulls right off and it's really interesting because um when you take it off, the device suddenly gets thinner, and you're like, hmm, should I maybe uh, use my Nexus 7 without the backing to save a little bit of thickness? But then <laughs> what you quickly realize is that the antenna, the antennae for all of the radios are in the backing. So oh, your, your, Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi signal degrades by like 85%, and your NFC doesn't work anymore. Oh, come on, who needs Wi-Fi? Yeah, yeah for real. Not- come on, man. I just use it to play Angry Birds. I mean, what's yeah. the big deal? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you no. go. So ch- check it out. It's uh you know, and and you'll see the spot for the the rear facing camera, and it actually has a fourth button. Um, it's got a Windows Mobile style soft reset key. No way. Mm-hmm. R- right, <laughs> right below the volume down button, which is kind of funny because you could get your Dremel out and you could like make a new button and you could like every time it freezes which isn't that much hopefully you can press the reset button and you know you whizzed away <laughs> and it and will it will actually reset the tablet yeah wow nice that's i awesome. love that yeah i'm missing like that, that from too. windows mobile yeah. yeah oh man i forgot about that thing that built into windows mobile that's that's actually really awesome hey brandon do you remember that time when i think it was the htc diamond that had that magnetic stylus and the reset but uh, the reset button was actually in the hole where the res- the stylus was placed and you had to that make that awkward movement to push down yeah that was crazy that Ooh. was um i think that was the beginning of the end of the uh the soft reset hole because you know <laughs> I, th- I think some some genius stepped back and say and said, you know, it's kind of ridiculous that we need to have this within e- an easy to reach place. Maybe our devices shouldn't freeze so often. Yeah, yeah. and then they put it behind the battery cover. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, being rather annoyed that I didn't have a soft reset option when uh, I had the Lumia 900 when I when I was tooling around with that and it froze a couple times on me. And <laughs> hey, just like, just pull just pull the battery. Take well, the you, hammer. You, take the hammer hey, and pull the battery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give me my chisel. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what um, that was. That was irritating. But I, I getting back to the camera t- discussion though. I I um I I, I I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I've missed it. I've started life as a ca- as a tablet camera hater. And I still think you look like a complete moron whenever you use a tablet as a camera. But I do it all the time. And we touched on this a little bit last week or the week before. But, man, I, I, I'm i using the Nexus 7 and walk around airports. I'm, I want to you know, take pictures of random stuff and Instagram it. And I'm like, no, I can't. i got to pull out my phone. So I think the addition of a rearward-facing camera, particularly to a 7-inch tablet, is starting to make a lot more sense. Brandon, is, are you going to explode over there? <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that you, you used to be a, a camera tablet hater because I was the same way. Until there was an until I, I came across a situation where I was glad to have a rear facing camera on a tablet. Um I was uh in, in my, my living room the other day with just my iPad, I was, you know, doing whatever on it, and my dog was doing something really funny. She was like sitting up like a like a human would kind of sit on on their on their bottom and you know dogs kind of <laughs> have four legs and i have i i have the picture i have the picture now because i had my ipad and i'm like i'm like oh my god this does this thing have a camera and i'm flick you know i i uh, i relegated all of the things that i don't use to, on the ipad to a folder called don't use and i'm like flicking around and i'm trying to get to it i'm like oh my goodness i better i better open up this camera before <laughs> If I went into the kitchen to get to get my phone, I would have missed the shot. So yes. I, so I, I was very thankful in that moment when my dog was sitting like a human that I could take a picture of her doing so, and I could only do that because the iPad had a rear-facing camera. Exactly, I, think, I made that I think, exact well, point. I I made that exact point in in the piece I wrote, like the Devil's Advocate piece, where I was like, maybe tablet cameras aren't so bad. And some commenter was like, I don't think the you know the 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 best camera is the one you have with you argument holds up here because you always have your phone. No, you don't. You don't yeah. always have your phone. Sometimes you just want to work on your tablet, and it, it, in the time it takes you to pull out your phone from your pocket or wherever it is, you could miss the shot. Um, yep. in, in, I, yeah, I completely agree, and I'm glad that you had that experience too. Go ahead, Tony. Exactly what I wanted to say about the saying that the best camera is the one you have with you. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. And uh, you know, the more cameras, the better. If it's a component that's not going to increase the cost of the device too much, 
There's no reason not to throw it on there. And this entire argument happened with the, when the uh, HP touchpad was first announced in the WebOS community. Everyone was like, there's no rear-facing camera. And then all the apologists come out and they're like, you know, I don't need a rear-facing camera on my tablet, so it's okay. But it's like, you know, if you can put it on there, you should. It's like voice input. It's like here's a, an it, idea, it's guys. another option. Go for it. Here, again, we have ideas as usual. Do you guys remember? Of course you do. Those <laughs> flip phones from back in the day, which had cameras which you could actually rotate. Yes, they were the best. Uh, How so about implementing something like that on a tablet? It will be on a swivel or something which will allow you to either front face it or back face it. And problem solved. Perfect. And position it so that you could prop up the tablet almost like a tripod. Cost the remains the same. Right. Everything remains the same. You have a front-facing, a rear-facing camera, 8-megapixel one, and you're happy. Exactly. Your front-facing camera doesn't have to be crap anymore. You can use the primary shooter for everything. That would oh, be yeah. That's great. Rotating cameras should never have gone away. That is the best idea I've ever heard you say, Tony. I <laughs> Thank <love> you. <laughs> <laughs> I, used, I seriously, I was in love with those cameras. That's awesome. I want to. I want to write a piece on that. You know what's not cool though? Um, yesterday was my uh, my sort of nephew's um, birthday. He turned three, and he got a Fisher Price digital camera. And mm. naturally, after he was done, you know, throwing around throwing it around on the ground, I looked at it a little <laughs> bit closer. I was trying to find out how many megapixels it had. This sure. thing, this thing was like nineteen ninety nine, and it it had like this. This maybe 10 by 10 pixel LCD on the back. It was so incredibly blurry. Um, and I was trying to use the camera. And, like, I have pretty steady hands. I have good hand-eye coordination. I'm not three, um, although my <laughs> wife might disagree at times. And I was trying to take pictures with this thing. And I couldn't really do it because it just took a blurry shot no matter what. It just had, like, the slowest shutter speed ever. Um, so um, I guess that's a cute way of saying that the... The phrase, you know, the best camera is the one that you have on on you is it doesn't always hold true if you have a Fisher Price camera. <laughs> yeah, Brendan, just admit it. You're you're sad that the, the Fisher Price camera takes better pictures than your HTC One X. Oh, oh, sick burn. <laughs> you are a dirty, dirty man. You know, I think you might be right though, and I don't understand when we criticize the One X camera and people get really upset. I mean, you know, if I if I if the HTC One X was my only phone and I saved up for a while, I would I would be very proud by the pictures that it took. But yeah. I guess I'm a little upset, and I think other people are upset too, that HTC touted the camera of the One X to the point of saying, oh, we have a dedicated image processor. Yeah. And if that's the case, why does it take poor pictures relative relative to other phones? That's the operative um, clarifier. Yeah, that's there. an important qualifier there because mm -hmm. I've spent some time with some phones with some crappy cameras recently, and the the One X beats those hands. I miss the One X's camera after some of these. So yeah. I get you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a positioning problem, right? It's it's what you just said. If HTC is like, yeah, we've got all this, like the camera's going to be the big focus, then the camera really has to blow you away. I, I, I liked my, I enjoyed my time with the camera, but I think it was mainly a software thing. I just finished reviewing the Droid Incredible 4G LTE, and it was really nice to get back to the HTC camera software suite with the unified viewfinder, you know, and the, uh, the, right. the fun okay. little filters and stuff. I, I really, I enjoyed it, and I, I like what they've done, but I take your point. Yeah, it's a it's a great camera app. That's that's for sure. Uh, speaking of the the One X, I do want to ask you, Brandon, to talk about uh, your time with Jellybean on the One X. We're running Jellybean on a lot of stuff, listeners. If you haven't checked out the uh, our latest kind of video series, you should. We're running. Um, I guess it's CM10. I'm going to let Brandon take it away here. But uh, on the the One X, the Galaxy S2, and the Galaxy Note, among others. Um, I kind of just want to touch on this, Brandon, and, and, and ask you for a brief overview of your time with that. Yeah, so I've been using the One X with Jelly Bean um, for, I think, a week now. And previously, I was using a Galaxy S3. And in the last week, I put some videos on PocketNow showing a CM10 preview on the Galaxy Note and on the Galaxy S2. And I had really actually high hopes for the Note and the Galaxy S2 because they've got the Exynos dual-core chip and they're just mm -hmm. great devices. Mm -hmm. um, there is a an issue with the... Uh, hmm, how do I put this? The, the, the development community hasn't figured out or is working on getting proper GPU support in these devices. So right now, mm. um, on, on the Galaxy S2 and other Exynos devices like the Note, all of the animations and everything is done with the GPU, so it's a little choppy. Um, but it's done with the, the GPU or the CPU? 
Sorry, my earphone popped out. What did you say? Uh, the uh, it's all the animations are done with the GPU or the CPU in the in this build. The the CPU. Oh, where, okay, all right. Whereas on the Galaxy S3, interestingly, that has an Exynos, and the Galaxy Nexus and the One X, it's done with the GPU, so you get that extra support there, and it's really good. But um, yeah, I've been really really enjoying. I've been updating nightlies. I think I'm running the eleventh nightly uh, on the One X, and it's so fast and um, I guess I guess the only problem with with using the One X again, it, besides the camera not being so great, is that it's got a it doesn't really fit my hands. Um, I, it's it's a thin device, very light, but you know the fact that it's so fast with with Jelly Bean kind of um, you know negates the the fact that uh, it's not the most comfortable device to hold. But I've been really enjoying it. I mean, I wish. I, here's one of the times where I wish I could, you know, turn on my camera. Um, it's it is fast, and and it's funny because I don't I don't remember. Let's see, last time we had the podcast, I was still talking about the Galaxy S3 being fast, mm -hmm. and um, it turns out that the One X is like a half a second faster in doing everything than the Galaxy S3 running a similar build of uh, Cyan Gemot 10. I believe it, and it, it's got to feel much faster, too, because the, the Sense 4, you know, the stock build of, of what the HTC One X ships with, you know, Sense 4 is lighter than other versions of Sense, but it's still a very heavy, well, not very, but it's still a, a fairly heavy skin. Oh, yeah. So yeah. The, the difference must be night and day between that and the Jelly Bean analog. I'm just curious how the official uh, HTC update will screw up that nice buttery smoothness with HTC and other deep integration the guys will do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Y you know, I, th I think what you say is very true, Michael, that this phone went into the drawer after I reviewed it because it had lag. And I was also, I felt... I, I felt kind of misled because the One X w was the first quad-core phone. And, you know, when we took it out of the box, we, we were expecting it to be the fastest phone, period. And it right. wasn't. It, opening a folder, you could almost count the number of frames that it would require. And, and now with Jelly Bean, all of that is a thing of the past. It's just really, really fast. Yeah, I remember, and I, I, that also puts me in mind of the differences you and I experienced between our two devices, which were visually identical, but yours was the quad-core global version. Mine was the AT&T dual-core version with the, with the Snapdragon, and, and uh, you know, it just, I, my, compared to yours, mine flew. And I was, I had a, like a love affair with mine. The, the, it's the HTC, no, it was the Lumia that started the, the Empty Nest series, but um, the One X, I still miss it. I, if you, do you want to you give me one? <laughs> Anyone? I you can really have miss. mine. Thank you. I'll trade you. For, I'll trade you something. Oh. Um, yeah, but anyway, yeah. Well, it, it's good to know that Jelly Bean runs runs well on it. I mean, it's. Um, I think I got a small taste of that when I installed the stock ICS keyboard on the One X to replace the Sense one, and it, it got me thinking way back then. It was about like, wow, what would what would stock Android feel like on this device? And it's good to see kind of just get a hint of that seeing CM10 running on it. I found a uh, an interesting feature of CM10. Um, I, I I I might have talked about this last time. I don't think did I talk about the keyboard vibration? No. So a lot of ROMs and a lot of uh, phones that are stock sh ship with a, a keyboard that vibrates with a little bit of haptic feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's never quite for me. It's always a little bit too much or sometimes too little. In Cyanogen Mod 10, you can adjust the vibration down to milliseconds. So I I was sitting there with the slider, uh, moving it up and down, and I got a value of 19 milliseconds. And so when I type on the One X, I get like a hint of a vibration, and it feels so satisfying. It's it's improved the way I type, and I I didn't even know that this existed. I think it's been in Cyanogen uh, mod ROMs for for a long time now, but it's just a, a little a little yeah uh, a added bonus. Isn't that feature also available on stock? I mean, not on stock HTC and Samsung ROMs, but on stock I don't know Google stock, Nexus, uh, Motorola, Motorola. The Atrix HD has it, and I found that it mm -hmm. ships out of the box with the worst keyboard configuration. I'm like, this it can't Ooh. be this bad, and then I hop into the settings, I'm like, wow, I can adjust the, the haptic feedback by the millisecond. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Michael, you mentioned that it has a terrible, terrible keyboard, and also the Huawei you reviewed had a terrible keyboard. Did you 
ever tried to, there's a tutorial and there's a calibration tool for, for Android keyboards. Did you go through with that or did you just use it stock as it was intended to? No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I did not. And I'll tell you why. Um, the HTC calibrate tool is kind of buried, but it's, it's more visible like on their devices. Mm -hmm. So I kind of give that a fair shake. Um, the calibration tool on the uh, I think on the Ascend, I don't even know if, I, I probably found it, and it, it didn't help at all because the Ascend just couldn't be oh. helped with in, input at all. It was, that was, Beyond help. That was a horrible keyboard. I, I liked a lot about that device, but not the keyboard. But, um, and the Motorola one, no, I don't, I don't know if there was a calibration tool on the Motorola one. I don't know if you could calibrate. You could do a lot with the settings. Um, but the point is, both the iPhone and uh, the Galaxy Nexus, you know, the stock Android experience, do not require calibration to achieve a level of responsiveness that is yeah. admirable, you know? So mm -hmm. I feel like if you have to dive into the settings and, and, and f freak with the haptic feedback layers and, and, and do all this kind of stuff, it's like, no, <laughs> out of the box, it should run well. This is like a part of the granny score that we do on the Scored for Me on reviews. Right. Where it's like, out of the box, this thing should be, at the very least, usable, and ideally it should be, you know, wonderful. Like, Which device do you think, guys, has the best on-screen keyboard ever? I mean, for uh -huh. me, uh, I, I don't want to sound like a fanboy. I can tell you that on a daily basis, I'm writing emails and texts in at least three languages. So uh, mm -hmm. auto-correction and spell-checking is off-limits for me. And using the keyboard without these, I find the keyboard on the Apple iPhone 4 and 4S to be the best keyboard for my usage. What, what do you guys think? Which has the best keyboard, the best SIP from your experience? Uh, Brandon, go ahead. I, I love this topic because there's such a difference between the touch responsiveness of one phone to the next. And I, I think, I, just when I think it's hardware, I, I update the ROM uh, to something that's not stock and it, the keyboard's better. And then so I think it's software. The touch responsiveness has something to do with the software. And I, I guess it's a combination of both. But to answer your question, Tony, um, I, I happen to have this ready to go. My favorite keyboards are on-screen keyboard experiences. The iPhone is, is the best, in my opinion, followed by the Galaxy S2. Mm -hmm. and, and that just might be maybe because we're talking about smaller devices here, followed by the Galaxy Nexus. So those are my wow. top. Hmm, top no wow. Windows Phone? Windows Phone has a great keyboard. No, that's, oh, you know. let me, that, that is the best on-screen keyboard I've ever, ever experienced on any device. When I had my Samsung Focus, I could fly. It was you're right, incredible. you're right. That's, it has an excellent That's keyboard. really up there. Excellent. And, and the, 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 part of that, a crucial part of that, is the, um, the audio. Like, it's not the annoying click-clack of, uh, yeah, of the iPhone, and it's not the, um, it's not the stupid, you know, it's not, not the correct cracker. generic one of the Android. It's this really cool, like, talk, 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 talk. And, it, like, I love, love the Windows Phone keyboard and always have. But on my Focus, I could, man, I could write you a book on that thing in, like, ten minutes. All right, I gotta change. I gotta change my list because I I I, miss, I forgot about Windows Phone. I'm sorry, um, but I would say iPhone number one. The Windows Dell, Phone number two. No. Windows. Well, well, the, specifically the Dell Venue Pro, which Ooh. like Ooh. wait, five, Are you five feet you're wide. hurting me now. Are you talking about the on-screen keyboard on the Dell Venue Pro? Yes, the on-screen keyboard. It, it just it was so thick. It was like you were typing with a freaking I don't know. Do you and see? then go ahead. And then, and then the Galaxy S2 as number three. So I guess Apple, Windows Phone, and, and Android. Uh, two questions. Do you still have a Dell Venue Pro? Gave it away in a contest. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now Which was actually a typing contest. Was it really? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you ran a typing contest, and then you gave the phone away to the winner of, like, the, the fastest typist? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. We should do that again. Um, that was awesome. It was. We we actually. Uh, it was difficult because we had we got all these YouTube videos submitted of people typing a phrase as fast as possible. <laughs> Some people were remarkably, ridiculously fast, like Olympic yeah. style. Whoa. And and it was difficult because we had to make sure that no one sped up their video. Just so we had ask that. Yeah. We we had them place a stopwatch next to like a digital like their their like another phone nice. so we could watch the seconds progress and make sure that they didn't speed up the video. Smart. Very smart. Um, that's awesome. Are you, uh, well, I'll ask you off the air. That's a, that's a different question. Um, we, we have to, we have to move on a little bit here. The, the, uh, cause we're not even through Android and there's a lot of, a lot of news to talk about. I want to ask you guys real quickly about this Razer HD international version. Um, it's been spotted. It's, uh, it's been photographed. 
What is going on with the pattern on the back of this thing? It looks like a, a, a like Louis Vuitton or like Dolce and Gabbana like postage stamp weirdo pattern. Is that on the U.S. version as well? What's going on with this device? I know nothing about it. Anyone? Well, I can tell you straight from the beginning that they look like biscuits to me. <laughs> with those two like biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> and not the biscuit from ice cream sandwich. Uh, to, to, yeah, to tell you honestly, uh, here in Romania, or I don't know if I should, should go on a general note here in Europe, but at least in this part of Europe, let's say it like this, Motorola is not such a popular brand. It's a US brand which somehow never got to these parts. Of course you can buy Motorola phones. Uh, we have almost every model available. It's just people don't buy it. Mm. I don't know why. I see. Uh, yeah, I I kind of like the the designer back. Um and it it probably is a little bit functional too because uh you know, if Sa- if Samsung is teaching us anything about the you know the texture on the back, you know, as seen in the Galaxy S three, you can have a much better experience if if there's something to like feel back there instead of slimy, slippery crap. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, that's a good point. I think uh, I think we're gonna get a, a, a live tweet quote from uh, Joe Levi on that one. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, that's that's fun how he does that, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I love. I I do love the live tweet. I called him the Pocket Now official human closed captioning machine. Yeah. <laughs> tweet this, Joe. And <laughs> if, if, listeners, if you're not if you're not following uh, Joe Levi, he is he hilarious. You really should. At, I think it's just at Joe Levi. Um, uh, to close out Android, I want to talk about Google Wallet really quickly because I did a video on Google Wallet as one of my first videos at Pocket Now, and I have a real soft spot for the feature. This is awesome because one of the big problems with Google Wallet has always been that you need to use Google's prepaid card, prepaid MasterCard. You need to load it with cash, like it's a uh, like it's debit a, card. a debit card, like a like a learning like a training wheels card. Um, but now, uh, as I understand it, uh, that is no longer the case. It's still going to use. The, uh, it's still going to use the Google MasterCard officially, but it, it uses it as kind of a proxy gateway now to your actual debit or credit card. Um, I, go I, ahead. I, I, I love this topic, um, and I, I loved your video, Michael, and I, I hope that you do a similar one once this feature is available. However, um, it, it only works on a certain number of devices. Oddly, and I just tried this actually as we were starting the podcast, I tried to uh, start it up on the... Um, the Galaxy Nexus on Verizon, and it doesn't re- it doesn't work. It's not supported. It's supported for Sprint and AT and T and T Mobile, mm-hmm. um, and you know I st- I have the app on the Galaxy Nexus, and it it like I, I don't see any way. I don't think it's rolled out because I'm unsupported, um, but uh, this idea of being able to to choose any card is awesome. Although I think it's I think the idea is that. I, I I was reading something about it. It, it won't sh- the trans. If you buy something at CVS through your Amex through mm-hmm. Google Wallet, it won't show up as Amex or CVS on your statement. It'll yeah. show up as Google Wallet. Right. So it, it's kind of makes it very difficult to track your purchases if you are a person who analyzes your monthly statement. Mm, but month. that's a good thing if you don't want others to see what you're spending on. That's very true. I that was my first thought too, Tony. I was like, wow, that's some James Bond spy stuff right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can use it to your advantage. You can, you know, I, I, I think, what do, what do you think, guys, just re- real quick? I mean, do you think it's going to change the Google Wallet's adoption rate in a significant sense, or do you think that there are bigger issues that are still going to prevent it from taking hold uh, in a mainstream fashion? Hmm. I can tell you straight from the beginning that uh, until I can count the number of countries where this is available, I can reserve myself the right to have no opinion on this. Of -hmm. course, I'm not only saying Romania. I'm saying Central Eastern Europe is not available here, but I can talk about the principle itself. I never kind of understood the need for using Google Wallet. You still need to get something out of your pocket to pay. Either you get out your Visa card, MasterCard, or credit card, or debit card, or you get out your phone. It's the same thing. You still need to get something out of your pocket yeah i feel like it's i i feel like for me i I understand that argument completely and until you can leave your entire wallet at home then this is not significant uh because we still have a long way to go on that 
But, right. you know, I think for me, the allure is the geek factor completely. It's like I have, a, I have my device. It is smart. And now it's even smarter because I can tap this on this pad. And now I feel like I'm living in the Jetsons universe. And that's sort of what I live for. So that, that's awesome. Plus, plus uh, I'm sure you guys have it in the States. But now with the Olympics in London, I see every half an hour a commercial with v- Visa's new NFC credit cards, which you just only need to tap to an NFC receiver and you're paying with your credit card without swiping it, without pin codes, without signatures, without stuff like that. So you basically attach your credit card to the cash register just like mm-hmm. you do with your Google Wallet enabled phone. And, and that's not new. I mean, uh, I uh, two, two years ago, I, I got a credit card and I didn't even ask for it. And actually, no, like four years ago, I got a little RFID keychain thing that did the same thing. And then about two years after that, I got uh, the, a renewal of that credit card, which had NFC built in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's becoming very standard. But I, but I, I think we kind of hit on the, the, key, the key thought here, which is that uh, the Google, Google Wallet has to have, beyond the geek factor, which is definitely there and, and interesting, Google Wallet has to have a benefit over... Um, taking out your wallet. How can it be faster? Most people, I think, are waiting in line. They're, they're checking their email or whatnot. It would be nice to be able to just, boom, tap and go. But with Google Wallet, uh, it, it's a little bit slower than that. Uh, you, you've got to put in your PIN sometimes, and sometimes you don't. Your screen has to be unlocked. There's a lot of steps mm-hmm. to get the payment to process. And then you've got to deal with people looking at you like you're about to yeah. you know, steal from the store. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And, and, and what if, at the moment, it's so rare you still have to answer questions from people like, what are you doing? Which is fun. <laughs> but go ahead, Tony. What if over time this uh, whole NFC technology will evolve in such a way that the range required for for two devices to communicate will be not limited to five centimeters or actually touching, mm-hmm. but I don't know, two feet, three feet. That way you don't need to get your phone out of your wallet. Out of your pocket, I'm sorry. That would be, that That'd would be, cool. be exciting. Yeah, I remember at my college, they installed some NFC door readers to unlock doors, and uh, people would walk around uh, like, uh, you know, they'd have their wallet in their back pocket or something, and they'd just, you know, put their butt on the yeah. wall, and then the door would open. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, I hate to – I, I got to keep it moving here, guys. We're running a little over time. Um, let's jump into Windows Phone real quickly. Uh, because we have a couple different news here, uh, Microsoft-related. Microsoft, we have a – we have a launch date for the Surface. Is that right? Yes. October 26th? Yes, indeed. That is awesome. We're going to have the Surface tablet in our hands before Halloween. Um, that's, that's awesome. What do you guys, I mean, besides that's awesome because that's all I've got, what do you guys think on this? It's good. It's good because it's in time for the holidays. Now, I'm not sure. It, we don't have to judge hardware and software launches and announcements by themselves. We need to see the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. How will the market look like on October 26? Of course, IFA is coming. We can expect some great, and I hope we will manage to film hands-ons with some great Android tablets. So let's hypothetically say that we'll have lots of new Android tablets. And uh, will we have a new iPad? mini iPad, who knows? So I think that the Surface can't come soon enough. Yeah, I, I agree. And these are the uh, the Windows RT versions only. It looks like the Pro version will arrive, what, 90 days later? 90 days later, yes. And I've calculated it will be somewhere in mid-January. Okay. So it's it's way past holiday season. Interesting. And that they're not going to bring the Pro in time for the holidays. That's interesting. It, it's well, another at, reinforcement. At that of- price... At that price, I'm not sure if anybody would buy something like that for the holidays. Well, that, that's true. And, yeah, it's another reinforcement of the whole thing where it's like Microsoft sees these as two very different products for very different audiences. And the yeah. consumer push is going to be obviously on the, uh, on the RT. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the RT runs an ARM processor, right, like a Tegra? Uh, does it? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So, therefore, you should be able to run Android on this, right? Well, it depends. It depends. Are are you able to run Android on any Windows phone on the market at the moment? No, I don't no. think you can at all. No. Or I don't so, think it's not that I, I think know of. I think there's some hardware limitations to this uh, beyond drivers and stuff like that. I think the bootloader is is the first thing which they need to address. And I'm not saying bootloader in terms of l- uh, loading custom Windows phone ROMs, but loading the bootloader from from android oh, yeah. or recovery and that that's just basic base level 
Kubo call it look at it like a bios just feel dirty even talking about it yeah. <laughs> I think it's cool that we're like that we can run Android on different kinds of devices. It's just that I, I I love Windows Phone's UI so much that even replacing it with something like Jelly Bean just feels feels wrong to me. But it feels but, unnatural. Yeah. By the way, Michael, do you want me to ruin your day? Yeah, oh, I always want you to ruin my day, Tony. Great. I'm not I'm not gonna <laughs> Okay. <laughs> to be short, we we had no time. Last week we talked about WebOS and open WebOS. Yes. I just had the utmost pleasure of posting a news bit according to which Open WebOS will not be available and will not be working on current hardware. On the existing Boom. devices, yeah, uh, I know. I know. I read that uh, last week sometime. Um, so it's just short off topic there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's okay. Whatever. I'm, I'm annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> I want to have a podcast. No, never mind. I'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, uh, we, we, speaking of Windows Phone 8, uh, we also saw some screenshots of new Windows Phone 8 features. Yeah. Um, and I was surprised, for one, that at, at, at its resemblance to Windows Phone 7. Um, I guess I shouldn't have been. I'm just so used to being kind of blitzed by these Windows 8, not Windows Phone 8, but Windows 8 home screen images where there's there's a lot of color. And, yeah, the Metro UI is still there, but it's different. And Windows Phone 8 looks a lot like Windows Phone 7. Mm -hmm. And I was both surprised and delighted, um, to use that phrase in an in, inapplicable in way. So I, what do you guys think about it? I love how Windows Phone 7 looks. I don't think it's stale or dated even yet, even after two years. What do you guys think? Well, the Metro interface, which, which Microsoft is pushing hardly from moment number zero, is only an add-on for Windows 8, whether we're talking tablets or desktop PCs. Then to get back to phones, I think they will continue to push it forward. But I would, what I would personally like, and I think many, many people would enjoy that, would be the ability to place a wallpaper under those tiles. I mean, come on. It yeah. would brighten up your day immediately. Yeah, oh, God, I just can't. It, like, it's gonna turn it into MySpace, though. Like, it's, it's just gonna look so tacky. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, not on you know our devices. Like, we're classy dudes, right? But and and people with 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 taste will do it fine. But it's like I just I'm envisioning like tacky pictures, like bad pictures, <laughs> backlit of somebody's cat behind you know Windows Phone tiles, and it's like <laughs> ugh. Anyway, whatever. Do what you want with your devices, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, speaking of Windows Phone 8 devices, uh, we're, we're hearing some rumors from Samsung about this uh, two devices called the Odyssey and the Marco. Um, yeah, actually, th those were some documents which, if I recall well, w were filed in a lawsuit. Yeah, against Apple. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure whether the judge was referring to these documents which were leaked or other documents as in regarding them as contempt. But uh, off topic aside, I think... Windows Phone 8 will bring that second chance to Microsoft and that second chance to OEMs. And on an additional note, I've read that Samsung is planning to go on big, to bet big on Windows Phone 8. Really? And I, yeah. And I think this is a good thing for the platform and a good thing for OEMs and, and everybody. I'm just not sure what to expect because the Odyssey is, if I recall well, the higher end among the two. Yeah. And the Marco is the lower end. What what will be the differentiator will be most definitely the price. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're looking at a focus and focus flash situation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see how those are branded. And I agree with you. It is cool to see Samsung kind of stepping up in the, in the face of Nokia's kind of juggernaut with their, you know, buddy-buddy relationship with Microsoft. And, like, we have this other OEM coming in, Samsung saying, mm -hmm. yeah, we just dropped that Galaxy S3 business on y'all. Um, but also we do Windows Phone, and we do, it, we do it awesome. Bam. Hey, guys, do you imagine the Galaxy S3 running Windows Phone? Like the, we, that's we what I was the, just going to say. That's, yeah, that's what the, the Odyssey is. I mean, that's what the Odyssey is pretty much. It's it going to be... It's going to be drop dead gorgeous, I think. That would be interesting. I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, imagine live tiles in such a high res format with, you mm -hmm. know, the, the awesome AMOLED color popping and the blacks and the. And the super yeah. fast dual core Exynos processor, even yeah. though it's not supported. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, it's on a slightly smaller display, right? Because we're talking 4.65 inch super AMOLED. Yeah. So it's more like a, like a Galaxy Nexus running it. But yeah. It's going to be sweet. Um, 
All right, that's uh, that's all we got for Windows Phone. I'm looking. I'm really. I've, I miss Windows Phone devices, so I'm looking forward to covering more of those. Um, jumping into iOS once again, we're looking at uh, a rumor that Sharp is shipping iPhone five displays this month. Yeah, they should. I'm be, yeah, Go I, on, I'm sorry. I'm fascinated to to know how they're going to deal with the screen resolution because there were early rumors were, were that they were going to bump the resolution, which would require developers to rewrite their apps yet again. Right. And if uh, so, I I. I'm, you know, very, very curious about that. I think the easiest solution would be to stay with the current le- resolution on the uh, width and only increase the height. height. Yeah. And that way, software and applications which were developed for, for the iPhone 4 and the 4S will work, even though you will have probably some compatibility issues or black strips at the top or the bottom, but that way your, all your applications will work. Black strips yep. at the top and bottom is not that. That's not winning. That's uh, not winning. I, I had to deal with that on the pre three for a while, and that was really really annoying. Well, it's a it's a temporary solution up until the point where developers adapt their software for for the iPhone five, which I'm sure they will do the way they adopted the Retina display on the new iPad. So it's just a matter of weeks until we see the most popular applications be fully supported, and a matter of I don't know a month until you see the rest of the of the guys catching up. But wasn't the Retina display uh, adaption just kind of wasn't that just pixel doubling that had to be done? No, there? absolutely not. Actually, it worked like a pixel doubling at the beginning, uh-huh. but the, the text and the images were so, so faded out. Were so they? then uh, developers had to specially code for, for the Retina display, and now, thanks to that, we have super crisp images and uh, clear text. So yeah, just no just fire up Twitter on the new iPad. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, oh, I haven't used the new iPad in like a week because the Nexus 7 and I have been having a love affair. The new kid. Yes. Um, what uh, Apple iPhone 5 is uh, speaking of the hardware there um, we're, we're seeing some more photos if if we kind of believe these uh, we have this story called uh, iPhone 5 caught on camera um, <clears throat> what's the veracity of these guys what is what has developed uh, this is an older story from about a week ago they've been so consistent what the design has been so consistent in the leaks the- the rumored design has been so consistent from so many different sources, unless they're all working together, mm-hmm. that uh, I think we know what the, the five's going to look like by now. I'm going to be the black sheep, as usual. Okay. And I'm going to risk saying that whatever leaks we've seen so far have nothing to do with the new iPhone. And I'm going to tell you this much. Do you guys remember, aside from the iPhone 4 Gizmodo stuff, any time in, in any any moment in time where somebody managed to leak an Apple product. Yes, the I, the new iPad, they leaked that successfully. Did they? Yeah, hmm. remember we, we started to right, see... But, but they leaked it uh, approximately a week or two before the announcement and not months before it. Right, yeah, that's hmm. true. So I'm I'm not sure what to think. Apple is known to protect their, their I don't know, designs, their upcoming devices i don't think anything we see today will have anything to do with the new iphone but we'll get back to this in a couple of weeks and uh, i'll either eat my words or i'll say i told you so (laughs) we will see won't we um that's a good point though tony and i i will look forward to seeing how that pans out um i do want to skip to uh right to our to our debate minute uh if you gentlemen are okay with that um because we do have some listener mail to get through and we are significantly over time uh the debate minute for this, or two minutes, or whatever, we need to call this thing something. And listeners, if you have a suggestion for what to call this two-minute segment, please feel free to write in. We'll yeah, the useless segment. The yeah. Um, the topic for today is how, this comes from Brandon, how Windows Phone can one day have the most market share. This is an interesting concept to me. Um, not only because of because I'm a natural underdog, you know, worshiper, but also because I think a lot of people like Windows Phone. I think Windows Phone is kind of universally liked, yet it hasn't gotten a lot of traction for a variety of reasons. So, in what what combination of circumstances would it take, do you think, uh, Tony? First, um, for for that to happen, for this world in which Windows Phone is the market share leader to exist. Two minutes. Uh, They're yours. Uh, no, I'm going to be used two seconds. It will never happen. Wow. Wow. Continue. 
It will never happen because we are living in a world where Android is growing and growing and growing. We see activation numbers which are close to 1 million per day, if I recall well. And of course, this will at one moment top off. Uh, I'm not sure it will be continued by a period in time where it will slowly and gradually decline, but I think it will be a stable number of X hundred thousand numbers of Android devices, and Android is currently leading the market. What Windows Phone might have a chance to is to catch up to iOS. Even that's a long shot, but I could see Windows Phone as being the second platform overall. But it's a long shot again. Okay. Brandon? And I rest, I rest my case. <laughs> I think that it can happen really only one way, which is, and, and it's, Microsoft would never do this, if they made Windows Phone free, they stopped charging a licensing fee to manufacturers so that uh, more manufacturers would take the risk on Windows Phone because it would cost them less. And then Microsoft, like Google, would derive their revenue from uh, licensing fees from the, the market and the content and the services that uh, that inevitably find their way onto these devices. Um, but, that, I mean, that's how Android got so big, because these OEMs were like, hey, we've got nothing to lose. Here's the code. Let's try to get it on this device. And, uh, and, and I think OEMs need a, an alternative to Android because they're putting their eggs all in one basket. And if Windows Phone was free, that would help them make that decision. Can I get a rebuttal? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I want to contradict Brandon, and I think Android is costing OEMs more than Windows Phone. Because of all the licensing deals Microsoft has signed with almost every OEM which is shipping Android phones. So the platform itself might be free, but all the royalty fees for patents are going to Microsoft. We have LG, Huawei, ZTE, and, and all basically all the huge smartphone and tablet makers which are using Android are paying royalty fees to Microsoft. So on a general note, I think it's more expensive to use Android as a platform as Windows Mobile. Brandon, uh, you good? Yeah, I'm good. No response. I, uh, I just have one thing to say, which is that I think that Windows Phone's explosion, eventual explosion, is going to come from a, a marketing standpoint. Uh, we didn't see Android become relevant in the States, at least, until Verizon pushed the whole Droid campaign, and that continues to be a huge winner for them. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just hesitate to put down Windows Phone to say this is impossible. Um, it may never be number one, who knows, but we do have that report from IDC saying that uh, they predict Windows Phone market share uh, is going to surpass iOS in 2016. That's some bold, bold forecasting, and I don't necessarily think it's uh, at all, um, you know, the word of, uh, of the Lord or anything like that. But uh, it's interesting that one firm thinks that way. No, um, I don't believe analysts at all. I don't, I you know, a... I don't either. I, I, I really have a problem with analysts uh, yeah, in general because they're wrong as often as they're right. But it's just interesting to see somebody go out there and say, yeah, this is what we think uh, about this platform that I think has a lot of potential and that I just think has been undermarketed. So, um, yeah, there that is. We'll, we will have to see how that goes. Really great topic, and I want to talk about that again at some point in the future in, um, in an editorial. Um, yep. let's, uh, let's jump into, we, I don't want to close the podcast without uh, listener mail. Um, we have uh, our first piece of listener mail is from Alec Vanek, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who asks, would you recommend the Cyanogen Mod 10 for the International Galaxy Note? Brandon, um, I'd say wait, uh, wait a couple weeks. I mean, it works just fine, but it's it, you, you don't get the full Jelly Bean experience until they figure out the the GPU situation. Nice, Tony. Do you have anything to add there? No, you should already have ice cream sandwich, and uh, if you're not happy with that, wait a couple of weeks and then check out Cyanogen Mod. Cool. All right, thank you for writing in, Alec. That's a, it was a good, nice to the point question. Um, Stephen Wood also has written in, and he writes, "Hey, Pocket Now, could you guys talk about HTC One X versus Samsung Galaxy S3, both with Jelly Bean, and which would you prefer?" I think we covered that earlier in the podcast, which was was great. Uh, just quickly, though, for me, it would be the One X, just because I love the hardware a whole lot better. I love that polycarbonate. What about you guys? Stephen, go to Pocket Now on YouTube. That's uh, youtube.com slash Pocket Now video. And check out the video I personally did about the Samsung Galaxy S3 versus the HTC One X. It's an in depth 10 minute video. We're checking out real life usage, benchmarks, gaming, stuff like that. That should answer your question. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, 
If you're talking about, was the question with Jelly Bean or without? Uh, both both with Jelly, Jelly Bean, Bean and the official, and, or the official ROM, and yeah. Yeah, I would I would say with with Jelly Bean, I I would also go with the One X. It's slightly faster, and the polycarbonate is much more uh, sturdy in in the hand, and and plus the 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 screen on the One X is more true to life than than the, um, the Galaxy S3. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Stephen would go with the One X for the same reason I would for the for the display and the amazing exterior. I I completely that that's just personally that's where I would go. I was in love with the One X's casing and hardware, and that display that bonded display is just incredible. Um, so I I'd, I'd go with the One X. I may be the, the yeah the black sheep on that one, but you guys are both Galaxy S3. Well, yeah. I'd be One X. Oh. I I'm with the S3. Okay. Uh, Stephen, thank you for that. That was, uh, that was an awesome question. And finally, uh, our last piece of mail here. This is from Casper. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Tell yeah, me what that's think. Yeah. Exactly, Casper. Terrific. Uh, he says, hello, uh, from Poland. I'm glad you've decided to bring Pocket Now podcast back to life. I think it's very good. Thank you very much. Um, when I was listening to the podcast yesterday, one question came to my mind. If you could create a phone of your dreams by combining different operating systems, what would you take from each OS? I'm interested in software, but if you want to include hardware aspect, go on. I'm curious to hear your answers. Cheers, Casper from Poland. Brandon, you want to start this one? or? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is difficult to, to think so quickly. I, I want the home screen customizability of Android with the, the uh, vertically scrolling-ness of Windows Phone, with the amazing on-screen keyboard of the iPhone and the amazing camera of the iPhone, and the awesome email app of Windows Phone and the browser of Windows Phone, and this could go on for a while. But yeah, that was an on, elegant answer. On that general note, uh, if we go into details, we'll never finish. But let's not forget about the ecosystem. Would you prefer the Apple ecosystem in terms of iTunes? Would you prefer Windows Phone's Marketplace with Zune? Or would you prefer the Google Play Store? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think his, if Casper's focus is on, is on the OS itself. I mean, I like how the Play Store is set up, so I would probably prefer the Play Store. Hmm. Play Store is very pretty, isn't it? It is. It's much prettier than iTunes and much more responsive. What about you, Tony? Well, I cannot use the uh, all of the features of, uh, of Google Play Store because most of them or many of them are U.S. only. So uh. here in, in Europe or especially here in Romania, uh, books, movies are not available. That's why I would prefer iTunes. And in terms of the phone, I'd, I'd build a phone around the, the iPhone. And that's because I love one-handed usability. I'm not a freak for huge screens. But uh, I was about to say fluidity but we're at one point where iphone windows phone and project butter on on jelly bean are at the same level of fluidity i think it all comes down to your perspective whether you're a widget guy you would take the home screen just like brandon if you're an icon guy you'd, you'd take iphone like me and this could go on and on well yeah and, and for me and and then i'll just be the really weird one i would yeah, take, web OS. well of course i take web OS. <laughs> <laughs> but you know this is a very good question casper because it's gotten me to think about something that uh, my ideal platform that i could build my Myself. I would probably take the WebOS cards paradigm, um, which is no surprise to anyone, but that I would probably see if I could introduce the Metro UI design language into that and have a very minimalist cards uh, interface. And of course, I would also take the, um, the very responsive nature of Windows Phone um, and blend that in along with uh, the tight Google integration of Android. That would be my ideal platform. Um, and I would even I would even sacrifice some stuff to get that combination. I would take Windows Phone Marketplace, for example, over either of the others, um, if that were possible with the Google integration I'd want. So that's that's where I would sit. Um, yeah. So th thank you uh, for that uh, interesting question, Casper from Poland, and also uh, Stephen, and uh, also uh, Alec. You guys, uh, thank you so much for writing in. We really appreciate that. It helps uh, spice up the podcast, and we like uh, feedback. So. Uh, before we head on out, I want to ask Brandon first if he has any uh, closing thoughts before we go into the outro. 
I actually don't have closing thoughts, but thanks for asking. Hey, all right, man. Well, it's, it's been it's been great. We've we've chatted enough. Uh, Tony, anything else? I I'm looking forward to IFA. We'll have plenty of time to talk about this uh, throughout our next and the, even the after after that podcast. But in the coming weeks, I'm predicting more and more leaks, and this is because I, I'm hoping to see great new hardware at IFA. And if that's the case, then we should be seeing some leaks, rumors, stuff like that, which should build up the anticipation. And I, I'm looking forward to that. Me too. That's a good call. I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, well. In that case, that wraps it up for this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly. I'm Michael Fisher. You can find me on the Twitter sphere at, at Captain Two Phones. That's Captain the Number Two Phones, uh, where we tweet a lot, where I tweet a lot rather, and uh, you can get the inside scoop on some of what we're doing by following me. Brandon Miniman is at Brandon Miniman, uh, and Tony over there is at Anton D. Nodge. I come my closer. Tell me. A little bit of practice and you'll get it perfect. Right. Okay. Um, follow Pocket Now's official Twitter account at, at Pocket Now Tweets. You can leave us a review on iTunes or Zoom for the podcast if you like the podcast. And if you have a topic, question, or suggestion for the podcast, like the guys we just uh, whose mail we just read, or you just want to say hi, you can email us at podcast at pocketnow.com. Everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. See ya. Bye bye. Bye.